my name is Jennifer Parks, and I run the neonatal foster program at Austin Pets Live. Uh, give me, if you would, a show of hands for people who were here for the first part of the session. Okay, so pretty much the same group of people. Okay, well, I may cover a couple of the same things, but for the most part, we'll be focusing on getting a foster program off the ground and growing it um, instead of just on the, the nursery part. Um, so we'll divide that into two parts. Uh, firstly, there's the kind of the internal um, framework that is supporting you as you work to create a foster program, and that will include um, processes, your team members, and the tools you'll use. Then uh, we'll talk about um, the all-important foster parents, how to uh, find them, get them on board, train them, and then uh, kind of carry them along with hopefully efficiency and compassion. Uh, okay. But wait, <laughs> what, if, <laughs> what if we don't have a nursery yet? <laughs> Great question. Uh, so, anybody who was here for the, the first part of the session will know that it's a completely fantastic thing to have a nursery. Um, I think Cassandra could sell the idea of a kitten nursery to you know, the most hardcore dogs only kind of person. Um, the benefits, I think, are pretty obvious. You can, uh, you can say a high, save a higher volume of kittens. It gives you a, a place, it gives you a location, a holding area, while you're trying to find the right foster for a particular kitten or litter. And again, it gives you a place for um, evaluating the kittens, uh, which is very handy unless you want to be evaluating kittens like on your kitchen table. So. Um, one of, I think, the things that I worried most about uh, when I uh, took on this role was I don't know enough yet. Um, I'd, I'm not, you know, I had kind of an imposter syndrome. Like, I, I don't know enough, I'm not good enough, I can't do enough. Um, but I think what um, we learned from Cassandra and what um, probably you guys are learning every day um, is that if you don't start, you'll never get anywhere. <laughs> so, um, if you save a litter, that's one more litter than was saved uh, otherwise. Um, another thing I was afraid of was um, I'm gonna make mistakes. Like, what if I kill a kitten? <laughs> um, what, if I, uh, what if I fail to, to give a foster parent the, uh, a bit of information and they accidentally kill a kitten? Like, what's, what, I have a catastrophic imagination. What's the worst that I can do? And, um, that kind of voice in my head is something I had to kind of give a stern talking to. Um, again, if you're not trying, you're not saving anybody. Um, so that is, again, something I know you guys deal with just as much as I do, but I have to tell myself it over and over again, so um, can't hurt to hear it from somebody else, I figure. Um, that said, uh, the more preparation you're able to do, the better, um, the more you know your foster homes and your foster parents and their capabilities, the better. Uh, so the takeaway is start, start now. If you don't start now, you, you won't uh, end up much of anywhere. Um, so processes. Uh, one avenue to foster is uh, really just from the uh, sending shelter straight into foster if you don't have um, a nursery. So. Um, if we didn't have our nursery, we would be taking uh, litters from Austin Animal Center or uh, other sending shelters to the clinic um, at the Cedar Chavez location, and but they'd be evaluated. Uh, and then in the meantime, I would be furiously typing and calling and texting and figuring out where these kittens would go. Uh, and then the fosters would come get them straight from the clinic. Um, they would hang on to them till they aged out of our program, and off they would go into the cat program to be uh, cats for the rest of their lives. Uh, the other option, if you're lucky enough to have a nursery, is um, uh, the kittens can go to the nursery, to the clinic, wherever you're able to do your evaluation, 
Um, they get set up in the nursery and it buys you time. Um, that is, the, I think, the biggest gift that I'm given, well, one of many that I'm given <laughs> by the fact of a nursery. It buys me time. If I am coming up with nothing, no foster homes, nobody wants this kitten, uh, they've got a safe place, they've, they're, they're warm, they're fed, they're loved. Uh, so it, it's an incredible gift that I, I don't think I take for granted. Uh, that said, uh, if there's a higher volume of kittens, there's a higher volume of volunteers coming in and out, there's always a higher risk of contagion despite our best efforts. So um, one of my jobs is to get them out of the nursery as much as we love it, as quick as I can. So um, the, the nursery is invaluable, but I don't want kittens there for very long uh, because what I want is for them to get one-on-one -on -one attention in a foster home. So um, that said, not uh, any foster work will work for any kitten. So um, another one of my jobs is to know my, my foster base, uh, know who's available, um, kind of being, keeping in touch with them. Uh, I use uh, an email list, email blasts, and social media to uh, let them know that there's a need, there's a kitten that has to be saved. Uh, so they'll go from the nursery into foster homes. Uh, this is the, kind of the off season for us, and so I'm lucky enough to have a lot, a lot of people saying, where's my kittens? I need, I need my kitten fix. Uh, people, at this time of year, people are saying, there aren't enough kittens, and I'm going, you wait. <laughs> you just wait, but I'm taking advantage of it. This is a great time to uh, kind of gauge the enthusiasm of individual foster uh, parents figure out what their skills are, maybe if they have been taking gruel kittens, but they'd really like to have bottle babies, and they know they have to be fed every you know, two to three hours, they, they know that, then this might be a great chance to train them. Um, and I can amass a wait list, so if something happens like we have a hoarding case, then I have a list of people who are jonesing for a kitten fix, and I can help them up. So um, you'll need, uh, if, you're, if you're using a wait list, you need uh, to know who they are and the easiest way to get in touch with them. Um, for instance, I've got, we've got a really wonderful uh, uh, bottle baby foster who just doesn't check her email. And so she, she has to be texted. <laughs> and if I, if I don't know that, um, if, and let's face it, I'm not going to remember it. So if I don't have it in my database, uh, I'm going to be emailing her and being like, like, but I need you, but you said you were interested, why aren't you responding to me? Uh, so the more information you can have, the better. What are they trained for? How do they like to be contacted? When are they going on vacation? Um, when, are they, oh, when are they redoing their bathroom and they can't take foster kittens for six weeks? The more you know. Uh, oh yes, on-call fosters. So the, the person I just mentioned, who is one of our lovely bottle baby fosters but doesn't check her email, if I didn't have a quicker way to contact her, uh, she'd be kind of limited in what I could use her for. But um, once you know who your foster people are who are like, I will drop everything and come rescue a kitten, um, just call me day or night, first of all, like, give them a hug. <laughs> I'd say give them money, but we already have established we have no money. <laughs> so high fives and then give them a kitten. <laughs> uh, mostly what they need to be is um, flexible with their time. Um, so people who, are, who can't leave the office for 10 hours a day, probably not candidates for being an on-call foster. Uh, you need them to be experienced. You don't have time to train them. Uh, if, you, if you're looking for an on-call foster, you're looking for something right now, and you probably don't have time to drop everything and do a complete training for them. Uh, so you, you need these people to be experienced. They need to be easy to get in touch with. Um, some people have their phones with them all the time, but just don't text you back. So it's not worth wasting your time trying to get them as wonderful as they might be. Uh, and good communication sk skills are helpful. Um, uh, if, you, if you know that a foster, if they say yes, they, they're really good. They're, they're able to come get kittens right then. That's great. Um, 
uh, if, they, if they answer one email and then don't answer the next several that you're sending saying, are you coming? Like, we have a kid that needs to go into foster, probably not great for this. Um, but people who are um, uh, retired um, or retired foster parents who maybe don't want to foster you know, a kitten from bottle baby to adoption, but um, kind of still want a kitten fix every once in a while, might be great for this kind of a list. Um, mostly you just need people who will drop everything and come get a kitten. Uh, let's see, okay, finding the right foster home. Um, as I mentioned, not every foster home is a perfect fit for every kitten. So um, when I get a litter in, I send out, unless it's a, a very particular kind of a litter with very particular needs, uh, an email to the foster group. Uh, it's, it's rarely just one litter at a time. It's usually a whole list of kittens that need to go to foster with their various needs. Uh, and they're all going to have, well, not all of them, but many will have um, uh, things like URIs or diarrhea or ringworm, and uh, the foster's got to know that ahead of time. Uh, mostly they'll be capable of handling it if they don't know about it until they get home, but they'll be mad. So, uh, even if, or if they show up and they thought they were getting perfectly healthy litter and they're ringworm kittens, it's just not great to surprise them because a lot of them have kind of nerves about it in the first place. So, um, that said, you need to be careful of your wording for things. Um, we, <laughs> there's kind of a code that we use, anything that says tummy trouble is diarrhea. <laughs> but there's no need to put the word diarrhea in every single one of your emails. I don't wanna read it and you probably don't either. So um, if they want to ask about that, they will. Um, that, but that said, you, you want to set them up for the litter that they're actually getting, not the litter that you like lit really well and took a cute picture of. Um, uh, th this season I realized I was uh, not defining my terms always very well in my emails that I was sending. So um, sometimes we, we use the, the terms like bottle baby and neonatal kitten interchangeably. And if we're not explaining what we mean, um, we might get uh, no responses for a five or four week old litter of kittens who are eating mostly on their own because we're calling them you know, bottle babies. It's that kind of thing that um, uh, the more you can think of from the foster's perspective, what they're seeing and thinking when they're reading, the better. Um, uh, gruel, gruelies. I had somebody email me and who I'd never heard of, she just joined the group, and she said, what's a gruelie? <laughs> and I wasn't defining it at all, and um, there was a point that I didn't know what that meant either, so uh, you're always going to have new people coming along who don't know what bottle babies and gruelies are, and um, what a URI is, <laughs> even. Uh, so uh, the, the more you can help them understand what, what you're asking them to take on, the better. That said, cute photos are always helpful. Sometimes we have people who email in about kittens when we've, like, we have not been able to get a good picture of them because they're just covered in poop all the time and there's just no way to make them cute and so they just look pitiful, but they need a picture so they got a picture. And um, sometimes that gets us uh, a foster response. They're like, it just looks so sad. Like, I just couldn't say no. And um, if I, it, we say often, like, if we just knew what they wanted, if we knew they wanted, poop-covered kitten pictures. <laughs> we would send it to them, but we don't know. Uh, so since we don't know, we try and make them cute. Um, this one might not tug at your heartstrings, but you all kind of want to cuddle that kitten. Um, I know that you do. So um, it's worth a little bit of time uh, taken to take cute kitten photos. Um, they hate it, by the way. They are not going to comply with your desire to take cute photos. Most of our most of our pictures of kittens are of this them kind of <laughs> like doing this, and <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So sending a plea. This is uh, just a visual example of what we've been talking about. Um, this would be an example of a single litter plea that we send. You'll see um, 
uh, G22, Cassandra mentioned using the hurricane system. So uh, when this was uh, screenshotted, we had been through the alphabet 22 times and uh, we, were, we were coming up with names like nah. nah. So, um, and I have no idea what that is. I don't know what a Galba is either, um, but Griselda is an adorable name. So, um, here's what we know about them. We know how many there are. You see that uh, up at the top, four adorable kittens. <laughs> Never like three adorable ones and you know one that's kind of <laughs> kind of a little wonky. All of them are adorable. <laughs> Uh, uh, you'll see that um, they're almost seven weeks old. That will tell more to some people than to others. Um, people who don't know anything about kittens don't know what seven-week-old kittens are like or what they eat or how to keep them alive. Uh, but it's a piece of information. Uh, one thing you'll see here is that there are actually only pictures of two of them. Uh, if that's all you can get, then that's just fine. Um, the other two will also look like kittens, so um, you only have so much time in your day. Uh, you'll see that they are eating on their own. That's huge. <laughs> People definitely want to know that. Um, and we allow people to, uh, if we have a, a larger litter, sometimes we'll um, split the litter in half. Uh, a lot of people just want two kittens, and that's manageable for them, and that's what they do, and that's fine. Um, what this does create is situations where people email back and say that they want, I want the orange and white tabby, and I want the blue and white tabby. And we say, okay, <laughs> because we want them to take kittens. Um, we, we have kind of erred on the side of giving them too much information, uh, if anything. You'll see the code, tummy trouble. At least one of those kittens has diarrhea. <laughs> you may not know which one, but if one does, they all will. Uh, so um, we're having some tummy trouble, but feeling better all now is, is what we've got here. So those sound like perfect kittens to me. Um, one thing that we had some discussion about this season was how do we express just how dire the situation is that we're in? Um, are, we, are we urgent? Are we double urgent? Are we code red? What are we, what are we trying to express when we use different, different terms? You guys will figure all of that out. Um, you'll have your own codes for that kind of thing. Um, the principle, though, is that if you cry wolf all the time, people are going to go, yeah, yeah, you always, you always say urgent, and, and then everybody gets into foster, and it's not a problem. So um, one thing that we are quite firm on is the part about um, sending depressing information to people. Some people are really sensitive to uh, upsetting information, like the possibility that a kitten could be euthanized. And, I kind of figure that that's assumed because we're, trying to, we're rescuing them and that's to keep them from getting euthanized. But some people are, are just very, very, very um, acutely sensitive to sad stuff. Um, so we want to be sensitive of that. So um, if we have a mom and babies in a high kill shelter and they're really going to be euthanized like by the end of the day, we'll say that um, because we need it to happen now. Otherwise, uh, for our, our, we pull all of our kittens from AAC, so we're not, we're not saying this kitten's going to be euthanized if, you know, if one of you guys doesn't speak up for it, because we're going to pull the kitten anyway. But um, uh, mostly, we don't want to make them sad if we don't have to. We would rather inspire them and make them go oh, and make them want to save lives than um, be sad about animals dying. Um, so once you send out your plea on email or over Facebook then in theory, you get to sit back and like, drink your coffee and wait for the replies to roll in. And um, sometimes that happens. That happened yesterday for us um, when we had a hoarding case and we needed a bunch of responses. They really did just wonderfully come rolling in. Um, in reality, it's often like, we still need a foster for this kitten. We still need a foster. Somebody please take this kitten home. Uh, but in an ideal world where you have lots of fosters who just want your kittens, then you get to vet your offers. Uh, so what I use uh, 
when I get an email in from somebody saying that they want to foster a litter, is uh, firstly we have a database of our um, of our foster parents. So uh, we have kind of notes about what they're trained for, um, what we've noticed really stresses them out that we want to try not to do to them. Uh, we look at their original application. So um, uh, all of the people who are uh, able to see our emails have already been vetted and approved by um, a team of volunteers. So they've kind of met a, a kind of a minimum threshold. And uh, you, they will have answered questions like, uh, where will you keep your kittens? And um, uh, how, how many adults are in the house? Like who's, who's available to take care of the kittens? Is everybody in the home in agreement about fostering kittens? Um, and I don't often see a no answer to that question, uh, and I'm just assuming that everybody always wants to foster kittens. But uh, if they say something like, in, in answer to the question, where are you going to keep your kitten? Sometimes you'll get um, an answer like, in my house, like <laughs> indoors. And um, that is definitely better than outdoors, but it's not the answer that we need. What we need to know is really, are you going to be able to keep your kittens safe and away from other animals and hazardous things? So what we're looking for is uh, in, my, in my spare bathroom. Spare bathroom is perfect. That's, that's my favorite thing to see. Uh, we'll see laundry rooms sometimes. We've uh, had some issues with foster kittens getting up inside appliances, so um, we're always a little bit leery of that kind of thing, but um, a spare bathroom is ideal. Uh, a bathtub, if they're young, all of that is great. Uh, a lot of the time, I'll see some of the information in an application that I'm looking for, but not all of it, and that's when I follow up with questions. Uh, like, do you have a spare bathroom? Could you devote, like, could you devote a bathroom to this kitten? Like, could you make your kids, like, use your bathroom for just, a, like, a couple months? It's not a big deal. Um, then the other thing that I look at if I don't know the foster well is have we corresponded with them in the past? What can I tell from our previous email correspondence about how easy they are to deal with and what concerns they might have? Um, you'll see pretty quickly that some of them, some of them need like a lot of hand-holding, which um, is valid, and I was very much that first-time foster. I needed a lot, a lot of hand-holding because I was very much the, like, I'm going to kill this kitten. Um, but if you're kind of overloaded and you have the option of like spending some time, either having to spend time with uh, a lot of hand-holding for a foster or not, depending on how busy you are. That may be really, really helpful information. Um, so you'll determine, is the uh, person who wants to foster your kittens a good fit for the kittens that they want? If so, if you think so, great. If not, is there another litter that maybe uh, they could bring home instead? Uh, for a while, as, when I started out, I was very much like, will it work, won't it work? And if I, if I decided, nope, I don't want to put them with that litter, I didn't follow up with what else they could do for us. And um, I learned not to waste offers. Uh, if they can't foster this more complicated litter, could they foster an easier litter? Uh, if they're not set up to foster kittens at all, have they thought about feeding in the nursery? Uh, if they have five dogs and like aren't showing a whole lot of signs of being interested in kittens, are they interested in maybe volunteering at a different part of APA? Mostly, um, volunteers are precious, and if I can sort of repurpose them, if I can't use them, then I want to. All right. As I started to learn my foster base a little bit better, uh, I was able to look at a, a litter and more and more often go, ooh, you know, who would be perfect for that litter is this person. And um, there are some people that I could just call on any time for any litter, but um, I know some people are uh, really chill about ringworm. And so if I have a ringworm litter coming in and maybe not a lot of time to devote to finding a foster, uh, I can reach out directly to that person and say, ooh, you're, you're in luck. <laughs> I found you a ringworm litter. <laughs> um, can you come pick them up? Uh, again, if you're reaching out directly, if I'm reaching out directly to that wonderful bottle baby foster, but I'm 
<laughs> reaching out by email all the time, then I'm not doing myself a lot of good. Uh, one thing uh, that was really helpful that I learned was if you ask directly, sometimes they'll say no, but a lot of times they'll give you more information that you want, like, no, I can't this week, but starting next week I could, and then they're on my list for next week, and they're gonna get another email. They're gonna get, um, they're gonna get a kitten pretty soon. <laughs> All right. Uh, one thing that I've been trying to focus on in the off season is uh, focusing on the new people. Uh, at the height of kitten season, I don't have a ton of time to train new people as much as I would like to. So uh, I'm trying to use my time to uh, get those people who are interested, get them on board, prioritize them for, uh, for kittens. It would be really easy at this time of year to just rely on the same super experienced, super reliable, old faithful fosters all the time. And we're doing that. But uh, I've got the time now to uh, focus on getting new people trained, paying attention to them to make sure they're getting the information they need. And it's time that I'm not gonna have in August. So um, I'm thinking a lot about that now. Uh, when they're uh, welcomed, they're told things like what kind of a commitment it is, for different age groups of kittens, um, kind of what's, what's involved. Um, and, I, and we try and set realistic expectations because um, everybody wants to foster cute kittens and cuddle them and their kids want to cuddle them and it just, it's a whole fluffy thing. But about you know, maybe half of kitten fostering is really cute and the other half is poop. And they need to know that. If they're not ready for half of it being poop, maybe another quarter of that being sneezes or something, then um, they're gonna have a tough time. They're, they're gonna maybe feel a little bit disillusioned and um, I'm not here to place judgment on that. I just want to give them uh, accurate expectations. Uh, that said, I'm not sending tons and tons of poop pictures. They, they happen sometimes, but um, it doesn't, I mean, you want that, right? You do. Okay, so. The team. A lot of you are one lonely person, one lonely foster manager, uh, and a, a small program can start with just you. Again, if you're not starting, you never go anywhere. Uh, that said, as you're able to, if you can add these categories of people, uh, they will be hugely helpful. Uh, we have a, it's a small team, but a team of foster mentors who are experienced, uh, know the ins and outs, both of kitten fostering and of APA, and they're willing to devote their time to uh, helping along new people. I will say that when I had my first foster litter, again, I was one of the real nervous ones, and I also had kittens who had five weeks of diarrhea, and if I hadn't had the most patient uh, mentor to answer all of my questions, I would not be here. Um, I would have cried and quit <laughs> if somebody hadn't been willing to answer the smallest questions that I thought were silly, but I was gonna ask them anyway. So um, one thing I tell new fosters is if you're worried, like, am I gonna kill this kitten? Uh, we're, we're giving you tools, we're giving you guardrails to make sure you can't go too far wrong before we get you help. And one of those guardrails is foster mentors. Um, they're, if you set them up well, they're, they're game for just about any question that you can ask them. And my experience has been that they're, just their compassion and their willingness to engage with a question uh, has been as helpful as anything else that I, any other form of support that I had. Uh, just going, like, it's been three weeks of diarrhea. Like, is this okay? Just having somebody go, well, we'll, we'll keep working on it. Don't, don't worry. They're gaining weight. They're not going to die. You're going to be okay. Uh, since a new foster isn't going to know, like, how much can go wrong before I, like, kill a kitten, a foster mentor is great at talking people down because, um, as we'll talk about later, 
fosters hit a wall sometimes where they go, I can't, I can't do it. And I definitely hit that wall, my first foster litter, when my kittens not only had five weeks of diarrhea, and, but then they popped with ringworm. And I said, I can't do it, I can't. And I had added a fourth kitten and I was in over my head. I was like, can't do it. Um, so having, <laughs> bless her, having Stephanie to answer my questions and say, here are your resources. Did you know that there's a ringworm ward at APA? Here's, here's material to read. Oh, you caught ringworm? Oh, um, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> here's, what, here's what has worked really well for me when, when I've had ringworm in the past. I would not be here. I would, I would have bailed. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so mentors, I can't recommend them highly enough. Uh, if, you ha if you're in this with a friend who is doing a lot of fostering and, and you can convince them to maybe take on another, one more person and answer their questions, um, you've got two fosters where you had one. Uh, data coordinators, it's amazing how easy it is to lose track of kittens if you don't have processes. <laughs> so um, we've got a... Uh, the spreadsheets that I use the most are, uh, we have, I have a nursery tracking sheet that tells me who's in the nursery, what's wrong with them, how old they are, what they eat. And um, so I use that to, to pull from, to plea for fosters. Uh, and then I have a master spreadsheet that just tells me where all the kittens are from the entire season. Um, are they in the nursery? Where in the nursery are they? Uh, are they in foster? When did they switch fosters? Uh, how do I contact their foster? And every day, that information gets updated. If a kitten moved anywhere, um, one thing I know for sure is that I can't count on my memory. So being um, strict with myself about keeping all of that very accurate is hugely helpful. Uh, among other things, you might find that you need to open up a foster. Uh, to get another kitten in there that they're really good at dealing with, like um, ringworm or uh, a bad URI or Khaleesi or something. And um, if you don't know who they've got, you don't know how easy it's gonna be to move those kittens, you're just creating more issues for yourself. Uh, ooh, a nursing mom coordinator. That is something we were without this year, and we really felt it. Um, uh, Cassandra talked a little bit about um, nursing moms and how how helpful they are in getting um, bottle babies on. Um, I did add uh, bottle babies to my first uh, uh, mom cat that gave birth in my bathroom. Um, I add, she had three and I added three. And um, they did all get sick. <laughs> they all got well. Uh, and I didn't have to nurse them for most of the time. So um, having somebody to put all of those um, little pieces into place is a huge help. Uh, we also have plea writers and uh, kind of a, a small horde of other people who help us out. So um, you don't have to have this whole setup in place um, that you can expand as you go, probably starting with, with the mentors um, who will keep everybody from losing their minds. That's me. That's not me, but that might as well be me. Uh, that, <laughs> that is every, every year, every month, but right now, probably. Um, one thing, uh, when I took this position, um, that I thought a lot about was, can I, given what I know about um, the intensity and the pressure, can I keep my eye on the ball? Because if I lose focus, uh, my coordinators are going to lose focus. I'm, people are not going to get what they need. Everybody's going to be frustrated. The nursery is going to be overflowing. And I could just grind this whole operation to a halt. <laughs> uh, and for me, keeping my eye on the ball meant I need to know who needs to get into foster today. Also, I need to know that the foster parents and the kittens in foster are being cared for. Um, so that's, there's kind of a, an overall, like, are, are kittens moving? Are the ones in foster okay? And then there's the right now today, uh, who needs to leave? Um, 
uh, Cassandra mentioned that we use an all-in, all-out uh, policy, which means that I'm focusing on a particular room in the nursery. It's never, almost never, uh, just kittens from anywhere in the nursery that I'm trying to get into foster. Uh, it's usually I need to empty out this room um, by Friday because we have to decon it because the other rooms are almost full and if I don't empty out this room, uh, we can't decon it and again, the nursery will grind to a halt. <laughs> so um, on a given day, my most urgent focus, unless there's a foster crisis, is who needs to get into foster and how fast. And uh, if I, mostly what I had, since I can't remember anything and everything has to be written down, was what needs to happen today. And I prepared the night before, who needs to, who needs to get out, or in this room, who's, who am I most likely to be able to get out? Uh, and um, what's my plan? What's my plan for the day? Uh, so you're gonna have to set priorities, you're gonna have to maintain them, uh, including at the height of kitten season when everything is just a madhouse despite your best efforts, because there will inevitably be that point where just everything goes crazy. Uh, and so if you're not prepared, if you don't know in your head what needs to happen that day, it's so easy to get pulled into lots of little crises, um, like uh, a foster has hit a wall, <laughs> and if I can't like leave them alone and let the mentors deal with them, then I lose focus, I don't get my kittens out, and the nursery grants to halt. So um, that uh, maintenance of priorities has to happen whether it's easy or everything is just going crazy. Uh, and I mean, the self-motivated thing, if you're, if you care about helping kittens and being nice to your coworkers, <laughs> I think that probably will take care of you most of the time. Um, so that's what must happen, uh, what that will end up looking like uh, is doing training, uh, coordinating people, so um, this year I had uh, two foster coordinators and a, a weakened me, who's better than the real me, um, luckily. And, uh, but they needed to be uh, kept up to date. Uh, Cassandra mentioned the end of day reports. Uh, we have a nursery one that goes out and I have a foster end of day report that goes out. I also have one, uh, since I have a weakened me, uh, one end of week report that catches her up on all the crazy things that are going on and stuff she needs to look out for. And if you see this foster email about this, this is what's really happening. Um, so um, if you're not making sure that everybody's communicated with, people are out of the loop, they don't know what they're doing, they get cranky, and you don't retain them. So uh, keeping, keeping that running smoothly is uh, absolutely vital. Uh, you heard Cassandra talking about uh, starting off with one idea of what something was gonna look like and finding you had to update protocols and refine things and whoops, that was a terrible idea, let's do this instead. <laughs> uh, so it's not as though we have a set in stone system, uh, nothing can change for the most part other than like we need to use bleach and there are a couple more things like that that we really can't change. Um, but uh, one of my jobs is to be uh, paying attention to what's getting updated and making sure that it gets communicated. Um, we just got today um, some updated protocols and they're gonna go up in the nursery, but I also need to make sure that all oh, my people will know about it because if uh, um, we have a protocol in the nursery and kittens go home with the medication, but then they ask their mentors questions about the medication and they don't know about the protocols and they tell them something different, then everybody's cranky again. So um, <laughs> much of what I'm doing is trying to stay a even just a step ahead of everybody else. Um, <laughs> along with that is um, the, the support giving. Um, I'm, I'm okay with the technical stuff. Um, I have some people that are better at it than I am, and so I try and let them do what they're good at. Uh, one thing I've, tr I've been able to become better at as I knew what I was doing more was uh, now that I've had a lot of the experiences that fosters have had, I'm able to say, yep, I've been right there. Sometimes they need you to be talking to them. And uh, so I can support them or um, 
uh, my coordinators, if they've been training somebody and it's been like really tough, or maybe like the, the person decided halfway through that it wasn't for them and they're going, was it me? Then uh, they may need some support. But um, uh, one of my jobs is also often to be one of the kind of the public faces of um, the whole of the program sometime, not representative of the whole program, but I'm the one they see a lot of the time because nursery people are back there in the nursery and when they come through the door, it's me going, want some kittens. Um, so I'm communicating with the public. Uh, inevitably, we're, I'm communicating a lot with uh, my counterpart in the nursery, Gloria. Uh, if, if I don't know what she knows, then I'm gonna screw some stuff up pretty quickly. Uh, and then we're communicating with the rest of EPA. Uh, let's see. Oh yes, okay, so I talked about the mentor team, so uh, we won't spend a lot of time on that. Uh, the mentor team leader or coordinator gets um, the tougher cases, they'll train the other mentors, anytime you can delegate training and follow up, that's awesome. Uh, that takes a lot of time. You can assign, uh, the team coordinator will assign litters to mentors. Um, uh, they'll, they, they kind of sort them. They kind of say, okay, um, I know that like, Allison has done a lot of ringworms, so I'm gonna give, them, give her this litter because she can talk them through it since it's their first time. Um, and then they'll be talking to me and saying, got this situation with this foster who's hitting a wall or um, this, this diarrhea just isn't going away and this foster is getting frustrated. Um, one thing we have the mentor team do is all work out of one email. Um, Cassandra mentioned that uh, this program is kind of 24-7, and so if they're each answering their individual email address as often as most of us do, then um, some fosters are gonna go maybe a little bit too long without getting a response. And I know from being that first time foster, clicking like refresh, refresh, what's the answer to my diarrhea problem? Like <laughs> make it go away. Um, the sooner I get even an answer, even if it's not an instant fix, the better I'm gonna feel. Uh, so um, whatever way works for you to make sure that they get quick responses, uh, that, that will do a lot to make the fosters feel more comfortable and more, more capable of dealing with the next crazy thing that happens, like diarrhea and then ringworm. Um, oh, uh, kittens kind of have the, mostly the same issues that come up over and over again. So we use uh, canned responses a lot of the time, and it's not in lieu of actual human communication, but if there's just a body of information to be communicated, it's worth taking like the off season, like right now, to write some of those up so that you don't have to type out over and over and over again what you do for each um, thing that just, you know, is gonna come up a million times a season. Uh, and then our, our mentors are, at this point, pretty experienced in everything, but you can assign them by category as well. Uh, okay, uh, we talked about the data team as well. Um, again, we rely heavily on our spreadsheets, so uh, it, the data person needs to be one of those really, if you can, a librarian. Like, if you can get a librarian <laughs> to be your data person. Type A people, really organized, people who thrive off of that kind of thing. Uh, because the kittens have to be tracked through the system, foster parents have to be tracked, uh, and we just, there's just kind of a lot of admin that goes along with, with kittens, as well as a lot of um, work with people. So, pregnant and nursing mom coordinator, uh, they, uh, we have, um, uh, the mothers of, of, in the audience are relating right now. Uh, there are lots of different um, foster uh, or um, shelter Facebook pages where stuff is popping up like, we need fosters for this nursing mom. And so a pregnant and nursing mom coordinator can be looking for those and going, ooh, it's the beginning of the season. And that looks like a healthy nursing mom with like two newborns. Ooh. I mean, we should count the nipples, but that could be that could be several more kittens <laughs> that we could that we could uh, just pop on and not have to bottle feed. Uh, we have a different uh, training that we do for our nursing moms than or the the fosters of our nursing moms than for our orphans. A lot of it overlaps, like APA um, protocols and procedures, but there's some stuff that 
um, will apply to nursing moms that won't, wouldn't apply to uh, orphan fosters. So um, we have different uh, training and a different uh, set of instructions. Uh, one thing we tell our, uh, the, the fosters of our nursing moms is that it, it's either kind of the easiest foster gig or the hardest. And it's the easiest if everybody's healthy and the mom's nursing and cleaning all the kittens and they, she just kind of runs the whole show and you show up a couple times a day and feed them and like weigh a kitten and go, oh, and then you go on with your life. But if she gets sick and they all get sick, suddenly you've got six or seven newborns that aren't nursing and it's a whole big thing. Uh, so um, one thing that we, uh, our, our commitment to our, uh, the fosters of our nursing moms is if that worst case scenario happens, like we're gonna step in and help. You're not gonna be having to bottle feed seven or eight sick kittens every two or three hours overnight. Uh, so the nursing mom coordinator can be helpful, helpful with that ahead of time. Uh, and right now um, we are trying to get lots of nursing moms. Uh, we got, yesterday we got uh, Seven. We got four nursing moms and three pregnant cats, not all of whom are healthy. Um, hopefully by the time the pregnant ones give birth, they'll be healthy and then we can put more kittens on. All right, I am running out of time. Again, lots more stuff that needs to happen. Um, and like Cassandra said, the people are out there and it's hard for me to ask for help, um, especially if maybe I don't know a person really well, but again, if you don't ask, you don't get what you need. So, um, uh, we're looking for uh, plea writers and data coordinators and have your friends ask your friends and uh, writing up job descriptions just like uh, it's a real job instead of a volunteer role. Uh, because we, even our volunteers, we want to be professional. Like Cassandra said, happy hour. Um, <laughs> happy hour can be team building. It doesn't have to be just trust falls. So you, you can... Um, Make the quality of your uh, your coworkers' lives better by uh, soliciting input. Um, we know that uh, you know studies show what makes for happy employees, and that's whether they're volunteers or paid. Um, and it's things like um, agency, uh, you know, influence and autonomy and creativity. So uh, the more you can empower them to make their job their own within uh, certain guardrails, the happier they'll be. I had one coordinator who was in her, I think her early 20s, who halfway through the season was really bored of writing um, please. And she said, please can I, please can I, instead of making bullet points, can they just be emojis? And, and I said, sure. You just make them whatever emojis you want. And all of a sudden, there were just like palm tree emojis showing up in the emails. And they got colorful and silly looking, and I loved it. Would not have thought of it, but um, suddenly, halfway through the season when she was sick of writing please, she was into it again. And that was well worth the oddities of any, any actual emails that might have gone out. Uh, oh, and micromanaging, enough said. Um, so again, we rely incredibly heavily on our spreadsheets. Uh, we have, honestly, I'm not quite sure how many people uh, work in our master spreadsheet, but if we didn't have that capability, we would be sunk. Um, pictures can always be better. I still have an iPhone 4. I need help. We uh, put them in Google Drive. Uh, I'm, we have photographers who love taking pictures of their kittens. They're great for everything. The easier you can make it for people to contribute photographs, the better. Okay. Uh, we have a set of training materials. Uh, we have a standard supply list. Uh, we have very specific instructions on how to feed kittens. We do a, a demonstration. Um, we have protocols for everything, including a fading kitten. And uh, one thing that we don't send out a lot, but I think I would like to start sending out, is just a picture of what actually a habitat looks like. Because that fits in a bathroom. And I get emails from people saying, oh, I feel badly because like, I, my bathroom's really small. And 
I don't know how many times I've had to say, but it's bigger than our cages. Uh, and it's one-on-one -on -one attention is definitely better. Uh, let's see, I think we've covered what we use and making sure we know what fosters can do. So, it is a, even now a bit of a mystery to, as to who is going to make a good foster because people can surprise me. Um, I've taken risks a couple of times this season on fosters. One time it worked really well and I was surprised at how cool they were under pressure and how capable they turned out to be. The other time it totally backfired on me and I ended up with all the kittens in my living room. Um, uh, that said, uh, we have a lot of people who are um, like stay-at-home moms. Not they're less busy because they're not, but because they're where the kittens are. Uh, homeschoolers, uh, people who work from home. My, my weekend me, who's better than the real me, uh, works from home, and so she can have kittens around and kind of keep an eye on them. Uh, it helps if they live nearby, especially if you need on-call fosters who can drop everything. It helps if they don't live outside the city limits. Um, there is a certain tolerance of stress that, um, that fosters need to have because kittens will like, lose weight mysteriously and have other issues. Um, and it's, it's a, just like having children, it's a, it's a constant cycle of caregiving. Um, so they have to be able to, to handle that. Also, we can't supply any of the things that they need. Um, we can sell it to them, but we can't give them stuff. So um, every once in a while, we'll, we'll give them a heating pad if, if we know that they need one. But for the most part, they have to be able to uh, bring their own materials. Uh, okay, so uh, this is the time of year where I have time to make ads and post on Nextdoor and do all that kind of stuff. So um, anytime it gets quiet, I start thinking about outreach. Um, that said, word of mouth, there's kind of no substitute for it. Uh, one thing that I would like to do more of this next season is asking, I know, <laughs> uh, getting content from fosters. Uh, we have a foster Facebook group, and sometimes they'll post pictures, but um, what, what we don't have in the nursery is pictures of kittens and foster automatically. So um, we can use those per, for promotional materials, videos. We can post them ourselves and say, look at this foster and look how great they're doing. This is what they're doing. Um, and another thing that I didn't do enough of um, is just documenting because sometimes kittens start off looking that pitiful and bald and peaked and they end up adorable. and. It's, there's nothing better than being able to give visual proof. Like, this is what we do. This is what you can do. Uh, because people want to be part of something special. Uh, so, um, again, making sure that people are informed. Uh, I've, I've talked to people at APA who don't know there's a nursery. I've talked to people in the nursery who don't know there's a foster program. Uh, if people don't know what's out there, they're not, they, they might be struggling to find their niche in volunteering, uh, and you could give them the key to a lifetime of being your on-call foster. Uh, they, they, this is so key. Uh, a few times, I have ended up rushing through training for various reasons. I've always regretted it. Uh, there is very, there's a, there are specific things that um, neonatal fosters need to know that like, um, cat fosters don't need to know. Um, some people are gonna have a lot of trouble with the how do I make sure they're gaining weight? Um, what do you mean they need to gain 5%? 5% from what to what? Uh, so uh, we make sure that um, they have the information, we send them all of it ahead of time, say please read it, People don't always do their homework, so we have it in print when they show up for training. We go over all of it with them as if I never sent it to them beforehand. And um, we do a feeding demonstration. I try and train um, people to hand feed on the kittens that they're gonna take home if it's their first time, because 
many of you will know, feeding, hand feeding one kitten is not at all like hand feeding another kitten because some of them sit there and are super good and some do like this action like on the syringe and are complete maniacs. So um, they need to know what they need to have and that they don't need to have more than that. Like it's, it's a pretty simple setup. Uh, and we actually make them sign a foster contract um, on the theory that it'll make them just a little bit more serious about what they're doing. Uh, so they need the details. Uh, we provide them, it to them ahead of time, in person. Uh, we follow up with a welcome email that gives them all of the links to everything. And uh, uh, since most people learn best by doing it, we make them feed kittens right in front of us and we watch their faces. And some of them are like, oh, this is great. Like, I'm getting the hang of this. And some people are, are like, not up for the task. And now you know. Um, OK, I think we've covered that. Uh, oh, but one thing about that. Uh, I mentioned that you're kind of oftentimes the first person they, they meet at the program. And so uh, you are their first impression. So uh, the more prepared you are, the more professional you are, even if it's just you know, the whole outfit's just you, uh, the better. So um, I work hard to make sure that everything is set up beforehand, so I'm not scrambling and going, oh, wait, I need a cup, and then disappearing for five minutes and coming back. Uh, first impressions do count. If they don't feel from the beginning that they're part of a uh, kind of an outfit that's going to keep them from killing kittens, then they're going to be really nervous. So they should know how to keep kittens alive, basically. Um, where to put them, how to make sure they stay alive, and uh, the fact that weight gain is key. Uh, who to contact when they have, inevitably, they have questions. How to get them adopted out. Uh, um, for us, that's how to get them on the website. What if they're terrible at taking pictures? Uh, what if they're super uncreative? they feel about writing up the little bio of their six-week-old kitten who's only been alive for six weeks. We have volunteers who can do that kind of thing, but if they don't know, they're not going to be able to take advantage of that. Uh, they need to know uh, how to correctly dose medication um, because kittens get teeny tiny doses of everything, and if they confuse 0.1 for 1, they're going to kill a kitten sometimes. Um, and then they need to be able to treat fading kitten syndrome. And this is the end of our training. And I've always wondered if there's a better place to put it because our training always ends up on a, like, what if your kitten is in the process of dying? But um, the fact is that kittens can fade and they need to know what to do. So we stress that it's not likely to happen to them, but we're, we want to make sure that they're prepared so that they don't need to be up at night worrying about their kittens. As I said, they will hit a wall. I definitely hit a wall. Uh, Communication and showing that they're understood, oftentimes is all they need. That's all I needed. Um, I needed somebody to say, that sucks. I'm so sorry. All those kittens with diarrhea and ringworm, and now you have it head to toe, and oh. Ugh. Um, that's just all I needed. And I could get up and, and do another day of it, and eventually it was fine, and here I am. Um, that said, just because somebody is willing to get up and try it again the next day doesn't mean that they should. You have to be use an element of judgment. And if a kitten passes away, you want to reach out directly if you want to retain that foster. Um, so we send out a survey at the end of every year. Uh, people have different attitudes about surveys, but again, if you don't ask for the information, you're not going to know anything. Uh, we know compassion fatigue is a thing. So uh, we try and make it as easy as possible for people who need to hand off their kittens for a while to do it, whether they need to go to a wedding. or um, We had a, a foster uh, uh, be diagnosed with cancer this year. Uh, so sometimes all they need, oh, another, another one had a parent have a heart attack. Uh, they were in, in the home caregiver. So sometimes all they need is the pressure taken off for a couple of weeks. I think all three of those just needed a little bit of time. Sometimes a babysitting gig, they'll never take the kittens back because like, they have cancer. But um, sometimes they just need to go out of town to go to a funeral or something like that. So if we can have babysitters, uh, that will give them maybe just the break they need. Also, people love babysitting because it's a short-term commitment. 
uh, happy hour again. <laughs> um, as I have felt more capable in my job, I've, I've had the kind of the emotional bandwidth myself to reach out and say thank you and um, check in with fosters just randomly and see how they're doing. Um, again, that's what I needed as a foster. That's what they're going to need. And then happy hour is just always fun. Now, any questions? <laughs> oh, thank you.